everyone. Welcome to the Invictus Leo podcast. My name is Ari, and uh, today I am going to be joined by Jerry Hallert in uh, Reno, Nevada. And uh, how are you doing, Jerry? I'm doing well. How are you, Ari? I'm awesome. So the reason that I wanted to bring you aboard is because you're an academy owner. Uh, you're a sergeant uh, with uh, Reno PD. Is that correct? Well, lieutenant now. Yeah, I just promoted oh, recently. So. Oh, really? Oh, that's amazing. Yes. Okay. So it's obviously stuff has happened since then. So uh, being a police officer who does jujitsu, super important. We both know the, uh, the benefits to do it. Uh, but one of the reasons I want to bring you on is because you have, you're in a unique position, uh, like myself and many others, that you own a school. We've got the COVID thing going on right now. And I just kind of want to talk about the process um, of what's going on with gyms, both students and academy owners, because uh, there's a lot of unknowns that are ahead of us, and we all obviously want to keep our, our schools open, and students want to see it too. So the reason I'm doing this is because I want to try to pick your brain and other academy owners' brains to see what we can do. So right now, what are the kind of challenges that you're facing uh, having your school closed? What are the things that immediately come to mind? Um, the first is just, it's really me worrying about whether or not our landlords are going to work with us um, on, the, on our monthly, so obviously April 1st. Here we are, um, really going to be our first month into the COVID issue, um, where now students are going to start debating whether or not they're going to pay for a membership. Um, as far as in the U.S., uh, President Trump put out that we're going to be closed all through April. Um, our governor in the state of Nevada um, also reiterated that we would be closed on on our quarantine uh, social distancing until you know until at least May. So now I think we're going to start seeing those emails start to come in. Maybe people who A, aren't working or B, aren't going to be training, um, starting to pull those memberships. So I think with that, with that in mind, now the, the loss of income, um, debating how we're going to make payments to obviously our landlords. So, and one of ours, we're in a five-year lease on one of our buildings. And the other one, we're actually due up for our lease renewal this month. So... Um, those stresses are obviously there, and obviously we know that our stresses of our students are on our minds as well. So it's it's a really really tough balancing act, um, which I'm sure you know pretty much every jujitsu academy owner in the entire country, um, really in you know entire world is dealing with right now. I think one of the uh, initial things that students or academy owners are doing is uh, they're looking at their landlords for rental deferment. Uh, if I mean I know that some are doing that, uh, some are giving like half price. Uh, to pay at a later date. It's going to be different everywhere, but I keep, I strongly suggest for academy owners to reach out to their landlords and uh, don't expect your landlords to come knocking on your door and go, Hey, we're going to help you out. That's not, that's not going to be the case. Um, so rental deferment is obviously uh, one of the things um, you said. So how long is your academy being closed now? Since when? Um, we closed mid, probably the first week of March is when we closed. So we sent an email to uh, both groups because we have two gyms. Um, just letting them know that obviously we were going to close and here's why. And it was prior to uh, our city of Reno mayor actually was the, the first one in the state of Nevada to put a closure out. So we put that out um, that we we're going to close and then obviously um, shot that out. And, you know, we got tons of support, um, people understanding, you know, that we're going to close and why and for safety reasons. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we've been three weeks in now and then now really the start of April is when I think we'll start to see that deferment of, of you know, students maybe canceling memberships. Yeah, and so I, what kind of I've been seeing is a lot of uh, academy owners asking for students if they can afford it to keep paying, uh, and you know something will be done down the road because obviously rent keeps coming out. And I realize that people are getting laid off and they're losing their jobs, so we have to work with everyone individually. So one of the things I've seen uh, is academy owners saying, "Hey, if you can pay, fantastic. If you can't, touch base with us and you know we'll try to work with you have you found that with your students that you know some people are like hey i just want to keep paying paying jerry uh and then others like hey can we do something in the end yeah we definitely see that um we put out kind of on facebook and instagram that you know that that kind of that same that same message that if you if you needed to to cancel your membership don't cancel it just let us know we'll put it on hold as, as you know anyone that uses zen planner or mind body or anything like that to cancel a membership and delete it out of your out of your queue and then have to re-enter it is a lot of work. So if you're, you know, you're talking 100, 150 students, you know, you're talking if, if they sign back up, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work and a lot of added stress where we can place it on hold with a click of the button. So yeah. um, we definitely put that out. Um, we've had a lot of students reach out, say they'll pay extra. Um, 
So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously they're in the position that they can do that. Um, but we've had several that, you know, have, have said that, you know, they needed to cancel or, or put it on hold, which we're definitely, we're good with, you know, um, much like most academies, we're a big family. So I don't really think we run it as a business. You know, it is a business, but, yeah. you know, jujitsu just brings out the best, I think, in people. And I think I would say majority of academy owners are going to work with their students. And one of the things that uh, I don't think a lot of academy owners are, are realize is if you contact Zen Planner or Mind Body or whatever like that, because since the academy is closed, I mean, those payments are still coming out. Uh, so we contacted Zen Planner and we asked them to uh, get you know, less because none of the stuff is going through that we're not using the retail or anything like that. So they are actually helping out. But again, you have to reach out and ask them. So it, that's just one of the things. And I do know that each state and each province has different ways of helping out. So up where I'm at in British Columbia, uh, they're helping out with uh, like our electricity bills. They're, they're giving discounts and they're actually doing rent free or, or, or bill, bill free for like three months for some places. Um, I know that Keith Owen just said that in the state of Idaho, they, he actually, he applied, I think it's federal. He applied for a disaster loan uh, and it's like yep. 10,000 bucks. Uh, do you know about that? Yeah, I actually just applied for the same one. It's a SBA loan. Um, okay. So yeah, and anyone that wants to hit me up on Facebook, I can share you the link with you. Um, yeah, but it's an SBA loan. It's a $10,000 loan. So um, we applied for it, you know, whether or not we get it, I don't know. But uh -huh. Obviously, a anything like that helps. And a lot of the good thing about those SBA loans for in the US is a lot of those loans, if you know how to uh, do any grant writing, yeah, um, you can actually have those converted into, into grants that you don't have to pay back. So yeah. it's definitely a, a good option for for academy owners and really for, for any businesses dealing with the COVID issue. Mm -hmm. And we, we keep seeing like when this all started that people are like, Oh, we'll be closer for two weeks. So we'll see April 1st type of thing. And uh, I'm a little bit more uh, cautious when things are like, you know, when people say stuff like that, I knew this would go on longer. Uh, I know you're not a mind reader, Jerry, but what do you think? W when do you think that our doors could open? I really think it's a regional thing because I think you you know see places like New York that have been devastated by the COVID. You know, um, then you look at you know we live in I live in Reno, Nevada, Reno Sparks area, and you know we're still under under about 300, 400 um, cases. Mm -hmm. You know we have about 500,000 population. So I think depending on when you start to see that social distancing and the quarantine, um, the the curve fall. I think that's when you can start to see maybe some some things reopen, you know, whether it's, you know, they go restaurants first or it's gyms or, or whatever they determine that, you know, they're going to open businesses. I think it definitely has to be staggered. Mm -hmm. uh, but my guess would be probably June 1st. Um, that's what we're shooting for. That's kind of what we're planning on yeah. is a June 1st, because I think once it starts to warm up, you know, I think uh, viruses have a harder time, especially this virus and living in, in hotter environments. So I think once it starts to heat up, I think it's going to be good for us. So that's, that's my goal. And that's what we have my, myself and my business partner, Byron, uh, who's also in an LE. That is kind of our goal right now is June 1st. Okay. And what kind of uh, future changes do you see uh, that will, you know, that will happen with our gyms and because society is going to change, right? Like think about what happened November 11th or November 11th, uh, September, September 11th, right? It's just like flying change. So what's going to happen with uh, the future and how we handle things? Are we going to shake hands anymore? Like what's going on? Uh, I think, I think the hardcore jujitsu people aren't going to change. Um, I think for us as academy owners, it's going to change a lot because I think we're going to see less of an influx in people that are willing to have the, the close contact we have in, in any grappling or, or any martial art in general, you know, we're sweating on each other, you know, we're, hmm. you're, you're pretty much on top of each other or in some kind of position for an hour, two, three hours, you know, a day. So I think the influx of newer students, I think we're going to see less and I really feel like we're going to see less children and less uh, young people, you know, as far as under 18 joining, because I don't know if parents, you know, are going to want to allow their kids to be in that close of contact. I think it can change, you know, depending on how the virus goes mm -hmm. and if it changes down the road. But I think initially, I think that will be our biggest hit will be the white belts and, the, and our children's students, you know, our child students. That's, that's kind of what we're planning on is um, less, less influx of new students. But I think the purples and browns and blacks and, people that have been training for a long time. I don't think we're going to change. Yeah. I, I saw another gym uh, posted recently that they are actually freezing all their students memberships for this month. Um, personally, this is just something that I was thinking. I don't think that's, 
particularly a smart move to do uh, because you never know what's going to happen the next month and stuff like that, right? So the money obviously needs to happen now and down the road, you can kind of stretch it out. So what do you think about that? People just say, hey, you don't have to pay for the month of April. Um, what do you think is going to happen to those gyms? Uh, I think it's, I think it's a, I think they're trying to do something positive, but mm -hmm. like I said, I think most of the people I know that own gyms, um, whether it's in my affiliation or any other affiliation that I've talked to, a lot of them are just, like you said, doing the, Hey, if you can pay, please pay. If you can only play partial, play partial. If you can't pay at all, let us know. You know, I think that's the, that's the right way to go. Cause I think the thing is all students want their gyms to be back right. when this is over. Um, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a bold move to, you know, cancel all your memberships and then people are, they just say, Hey, maybe the gym's going to close. And then when they reopen in two or three months, maybe people aren't used to paying anymore. Maybe they found another gym that stayed open. Right. You know, maybe the landlord only gives them one month, you know, off from paying rent. So, you know, say they say, Hey, you know, April, we're going to go ahead and, you know, do the rental deferment or we're just not going to charge you that month, you know, make an addendum to the lease. Mm -hmm. But now May rolls around and now people are still not paying. And then June rolls around and people are still not paying. So, you know, some, some academies have really, really high lease, you know, rental agreements. And I mean, that can, that could crush you. I mean, yeah. you know, we have a savings, but I mean, four or five, six months of, of no income. Blow through not, that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, close our doors. So with all the negativity that's being happening, I've seen a ton of positive stuff that's, that's come out. Uh, a lot of free videos, a lot of people offering stuff, BGJ Fanatics, uh, Tom DeBlas, all those guys. It's been amazing. And uh, the content out there is just, I've never seen it like in the past month. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And I'm kind of hoping that it brings the community together more after this, you know, after this is over. Um, what, what kind of thing are you going to, or are you going to do for your students? Like for me, for example, uh, when we open up just as a thank you, I'm going to give everyone a private lesson in my school, uh, on me just because it's something I want to do. And, you know, I know it's just a small thing, but it's just something that I need to, you know, give back. I'm not going to put out tons of videos because there's lots of people doing that. And I've done that before. <laughs> uh, but yes. every, everyone has something that they're going to try to offer. What kind of things do you think that, teachers can offer or academy owners can offer to help? Um, so something that we're going to do is the first is obviously because we have a clothing line, but regardless, most almost every gym has their own t-shirts or whatever they get done. So we're going to offer all that at cost. Um, oh, okay. Brass guard shorts, all that stuff for our academy. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, actually, we're going to probably bring, end up bringing Gordon Ryan or Gary Tunnan up to Reno for a free seminar. So we're going to pay oh, wow. for them to come up. Um, actually, just just message Gordon about 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, as soon as this clears up, him and Gary need to come up. So um, Gordon's been really, really good for our gym. Yeah. Uh, he came into the free seminar for the We Defy Foundation for a fundraiser. Um, so we have a really good connection with him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's something we even put out on, on Facebook and Instagram that, you know, once this clears out, you know, the people that stay and can, and, 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 you know, continue to pay. And even those ones that just let us know, hey, just put it on hold. Yeah. We're going to do a closed door, you know, our account academy only uh, major seminar with a superstar and oh, obviously awesome. everybody knew it was going to be Gordon or Gary just because we brought Gordon up here twice so. right yeah but yeah. I think that's that's you know I think that's a positive way to bring it um mm -hmm. I do know I was I was listening to a lot of other people um I was talking to, to my coach Marcos Torgrosa mm -hmm. and they talked about doing like kind of a traveling uh, professor where you know Marcos would trade out with you know maybe someone in Chicago and they oh. would they would switch gyms for like a week huh so you'd have an instructor, a high level instructor from another gym come to your gym for like a week and teach and do kind of like a, like a swap. That's a great idea. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And so it's I kind of a way for, you know, your students to get a high level instruction, you know, but not just a one hour seminar or a two hour right. seminar. You're talking about a week of classes. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's, I haven't heard that before. So I really like that idea. And this is actually kind of the reason that I want to talk to, to coaches and stuff, because there's ideas that I just, you just never thought of. So um, that's great. And you obviously, you do have a clothing line, do you? Because uh, a lot of people don't know about it. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I love your stuff. Uh, you designed our very first rash guard for Invictus. Uh, which was their Spartan rash guard, which was, which was great. Uh, you did a limited edition run for uh, submissions 101, which is amazing. You did the rash guards for my school, which are amazing. So uh, I really do appreciate you and, and the, the stuff that you do and your designers and stuff. It's great. So tell us, uh, cause people don't know about it. There's so many awesome 
companies out there. Tell us about your company, how it started, when it started. Um, so, gosh, it was like about 2009. Uh, I was a I was a brown belt, uh, and I got tired of buying sixty dollar rash guards online. And uh, and actually, another guy locally had started a clothing line, and I didn't like his his designs. I'm like, dude, let me let me help you out. Uh-huh. And uh, he's like, no, we're good. I'm like, well, give me your artist. So he gave me his artist info, uh, Jay Acosta, who's phenomenal. Um, and then kind of just started, you know. And you've gone through the process of getting something designed. You have your vectored logos, your panels are ready to go, and then you start shipping it out to to manufacturers and you get everything from, you know, F minuses to A pluses. <laughs> yeah. So, you, you know, you got to kind of find the, the companies you like that are, are good manufacturers that are legitimate and then you stay with those. Yeah. Um, so we, we did that. I, we probably ordered 50 samples um, from different companies and, you know, at, you know, 50 to 60 bucks a sample that can add up, but you know, the initial investment paid off and it's more of a labor of love. We don't, you know, we don't make a ton of money right. off the clothing. I just, I enjoy making, making, you know, having Jay make artwork off my ideas. And then, you know, we ship it out and people get good gear at great prices. And, mm-hmm. you know, we get to help support law enforcement or, or whatever it is. And we get to, we donate a ton of, ton of free gear to people when they're having, you know, issues, uh, just did stuff for Chad George. Uh, one of my buddies down in LA, he runs a CMMA. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did a big fundraiser. So for their annual party and I sent him a bunch of keys and stuff like that, just, just to help them out. You know, it's, it's good for us. It gets the brand out. Yeah. It's been pretty awesome. So you obviously seen a lot of designs over the years for rash guards and stuff. And uh, what was kind of a, a design that was really popular amongst companies that you were just like, God, I can't stand seeing these. Like, you don't have to give names to companies, but you know, there's like those designs that came out that you were just like, what, why is everyone doing that? Did anything come to mind for that? Yeah, I think like the traditional like tattoo like Japanese tattoo I don't know. I just never... I don't love that stuff. Uh-huh. Like, I think it looks great on, you know, I'm, I'm a tattoo. I like tattoos, but um, I just don't like it on rash guards. So I like more of the clean look. You know, we have some pretty, pretty wild rash guards as far as coloring and stuff like that. But um, I'm big on the, the artwork being clean. Yeah. And, you know, the artwork being very distinct, you know, yeah. and detailed. Because I think it's easy for, you know, that's the problem. That's, and that's why we've stuck with the same artist since we opened. You know, Jay's done 99, 95% of our artwork for all our rash guards. Mm-hmm. So. You know, I just think that that clean, really clean product that, you know, it's vectored correctly. And when it's put when it's placed on, you know, the panels, it just comes out beautifully. So, you know, like the Invictus Rash Guard turned out better than I thought it was. Yeah, so really the right. artwork that you're getting in your mocks should be coming up looking better on the actual product and not vice versa. Yeah. I remember years ago. So when I designed my very first rash guard, this is before rash guards, actually, this is before sublimation, right? So uh, I was looking around and they were actually the surfer rash guards. And I'm like, Hey, can we put a print on it? So we did like a submissions one, one print. And I think this was in 2000, about 2007. And we got the rash guards and they were pressed on heat press. And you can imagine what happened to them, right? You wash them, you roll with them. And I remember I got them for my school and after grappling, I looked and I saw these little pieces of white on the mats. I'm like, what is that? And it was all the logos completely had rubbed off because people are on their backs and playing guards. So uh, we've come a long way, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we did the same thing with our first set of rash guards. Yeah. So yeah. not from the from our clothing, but the first rash guards I got from, you know, when I started at jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, you also run, so in your school, I mean, it's open to the public and uh, normal jiu-jitsu classes, but you also have a law enforcement uh, uh, training side. Why don't you tell us about that? Um, so obviously I, I became a cop when I was uh, just before my purple belt promotion. Mm-hmm. So I went through the academy and uh, obviously I think you kind of went through the same thing because you became an officer later in your life. Yeah. Um, going through the police academy and watching the defensive tactics and the, you know, the weaponless defense uh, I, you know, they kind of picked on me, obviously the instructors, they would send everybody else out of the classroom and then they'd hold me in there and say, Hey, let's try this technique on you. And what would you do? And then, you know, they realized that, you know, <laughs> grappling arts and, you know, my, 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 you know, small wrestling background, plus my, you know, my jujitsu skill set. Yeah. And I was destroying the, destroying the instructors. So it was one of those things where I think I saw that opening and then, uh, I just really didn't see a change in, in tactics or in what we were teaching. So at the time, we actually got really lucky. So our chief of police at the time was actually a black belt in judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, oh. uh, Steve Pitts. So he's actually the one that got me to be, a, turned me into being a cop. 
So, cause I did jujitsu with him. He's like, why don't you be a police officer? I'm like, nah. And he's like, come on. So I did it. And yeah. then, uh, so he put me as a, I wasn't even, I was still on probation. I actually, three weeks after I got out of training, um, he made me the, the assistant lead for defensive tactics. So, wow. And I, ha- and I have a teaching background. I taught high school for a couple of years. So mm-hmm. um, I know how to do like a syllabus and curriculum. So I, I just wrote a program for Reno PD and uh, he advised me to go ahead and, and market it and brand it and uh, train everybody. So we've, from there, you know, we've, we've revamped it a ton of times. I think it's big to do that. Um, I think I've rewritten the lesson plan eight or nine times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got some really, really big name, big name guys in jujitsu, you know, contribute to us. You know, I've added stuff that Gordon has showed. I've added stuff that obviously my coach Marcos Torgrosso showed. Uh, Ricky Lindell was a big, a big mm-hmm. proponent um, of training. He brought us down to Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of opportunities. We've trained in Austin, Texas with some really great guys at Austin PD, um, trained Vegas Metro, where obviously that's where I met Chad uh, Lyman. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a great guy. Him and Mike Bland are phenomenal instructors. And then just kind of taught and, you know, just trying to get it out to law enforcement because I, I don't think there's a more important skill set for cops than, than learning jujitsu, you know, and grappling arts. You know, that's mm-hmm. that very, very high chance, high frequency and high risk. You know, a lot of people work on firearms, which is definitely important, but you know, you have low frequency, high risk and hands-on stuff is, that's almost every call. And your company or the branch, it's uh, Leo Defense Systems, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, And who comes to that? Is it the Reno guys? Are you getting from other departments too that come there or? Yeah, we try to do one annual seminar. Um, So we actually teach that curriculum at our gym. Um, so if we, we have classes that are primarily cops, so we'll teach portions of that program, uh, during the class time. Okay. And then, and then we'll teach, you know, tra- more traditional sport jujitsu or self-defense. Um, but then we'll do the seminars where we do pullouts. We'll do like a 40 hour pullout where we actually certify instructors. Uh, most recently, uh, Kyle McCutcheon, yep. um, from Washington, great guy, really, really phenomenal dude and a black belt. Uh, he came up, he got certified and he came up with Craig on and, uh, they got certified. So we, we, you know, we get people from, from all over that come in and get certified, but um, almost every local agency we have uh, has certified instructors. Okay. What kind of thing have you seen? Like if you were going to th- pick a move that they teach in the Academy, that's not jujitsu based that you think that should be removed. Um, that's ridiculous uh, that they keep teaching. What comes to mind for you? <sighs> There's so many. <laughs> um, yeah. I think a lot of the twist locks, I think that, you know, the small joint manipulation is very hard to do live mm-hmm. um, with someone that's resisting. So a lot of that stuff, you know, some of the stuff's great and you know, the, the rear wrist locks and stuff like that, but I really don't like the, the twist locks or the entries. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, that's something I would probably get rid of. Yeah. Um, we've kind of moved them more to like more of like a wrestling contact arm drags going to two on ones, you know, the Russian tie series yeah. um, for our contacts. Cause you know, I think that moderate level contact, it's, it's, it's one of those areas that's very, very vague. I know at least the way we teach the twist lock, I don't think it's very effective. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen people, you know, struggle on the street to do it live, even with a non-resisting person. Yep. And I've never seen anyone get it on live. I know I've tried it on people just to try it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I struggle with it. And I feel like I'm pretty decent going hands-on. But, yeah. you know, when I can't do a move, I'm like, eh, I don't know if this is, if this is a very legitimate move. So, like I said, you know, I'd have to sit down, you know, and look at the list. I could probably, you know, mark red lines through a lot of techniques. Uh-huh. I'm sure you could do the same at your department as could, you know, any high level black belt or high level instructor at any department do that to their curriculum. It's pretty actually, it's pretty cool seeing uh, these different places like, you know, uh, how you're teaching and how Chad's teaching uh, and all the guys who are involved in Invictus. There's a lot of, um, it's like cross pollination, as you said. We're we're really sharing stuff, and there is a theme that's starting to come out. I've noticed again. You're talking about the two on one, and just kind of that more basic body positioning and wrestling, and just takedowns and just control. And it, it's changing. Like I watched a video which was maybe 25 years old of old police tactics, and it is awesome to watch, and awesome in a really bad way, you know. Yes. And I'm not saying that we're perfect because we're not, and we're learning all the time, but. As you know, jiu-jitsu really is a great base to have. And uh, those old moves of, it's, just, it, it's nuts. Like, they're all yeah. over the place. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So from, from here, where do you go? Uh, you know, you're sitting at home. You're trying to keep, 
keep sane. You're obviously, you know, keeping your, your kids sane and everyone else, but how are you keeping your, on top of your jujitsu? What are you doing? Um, so I did, I did pick one person, uh, one of my brown belts, Brian Dye, who's a, he's also a sergeant um, mm-hmm. at my department. So him and I are doing videos um, and we're rolling together. Um, obviously mm-hmm. social distancing, social distancing, but I, if I can limit my contact to just him, him and I are just rolling together. Yeah. Really just trying to A, develop him, you know, working on that, that, at that attainment, you know, getting him ready for black belt. Um, and he's a, he's a tough role. You know, he's a 205 pound athletic brown belt and he's mean. So it's good for me. So we'll shoot some videos and then we'll roll. So that's really what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm trying to schedule maybe going up and seeing my coach in Sacramento. Um, but he's kind of dealing with the same thing. He's picking one of his black belts that he's shooting videos with, um, just, just to put out, you know, through zoom or whatever platform they choose. So that's really all, that's really all you can do right now. And I think, Now's the time to watch video, you know, and develop, develop the mind, you know, harden the mind. I think that's the big thing. I think being quarantined, you know, or the social listening definitely creates that, you know, my, my poor wife, she's a, she's a hairstylist. She's stuck at home with the kids. I get to leave for work. Right. I think she has it worse than I do, you know? So I think that's, I think that's the biggest thing. Harden the mind. I think now's the time to open up people's games. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's, I've even seen online where people were using sweatshirts in their, you know, their gi top to create a dummy. Right. You know, there's some pretty, like you said, the, the amount of videos and content that out is out there right now is amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and the guys that are putting it out, you know, Dan Hurd put the solo drills out like for free. If you're not doing that, you are crazy. You know, that guy's the, you know, the number one coach in the entire world. Yeah. Like, why are people not doing the solo drills that's for free that Dan Hurd put out, you know, and Gordon's got a huge discount on his stuff and Tom DeBlas put stuff out. I mean, there is so much content out there um, right now, like you said, just, now is the time to get that content and develop your game. And, you know, once the gyms do open back up, cause they're going to, you're going to be better for it. The ironic part to this is prior to the COVID, uh, the internet memes of like, you can't learn jujitsu from videos. Don't do it. It's only live. And, you know, they gave the, you know, all this shit towards the Gracie's and Gracie HQ for doing that and stuff. But now, I mean, we're, we have to do it. Right. So absolutely. Uh, I agree. And one of the things, so I need, I need you to kind of comment on being a black belt. And when we watch videos, it's very easy to go, Oh, I see what they're doing. I got it. That type of thing. What should a white belt or a blue belt uh, avoid watching videos? uh, You know, so they don't get caught up. Someone said, you know, watch the fancy stuff. It was talking to Jason actually. And he was like, you know, that fancy stuff is, is good, but it's going to screw you up or you won't be able to catch on. So. Um, I think the biggest thing on that is watch techniques that you already know, you know, so say you're a, you know, say you're, you've just started, you know, you know, maybe a basic arm bars, triangles, a guard series going, um, watch a high level, some high level videos and, you know, maybe a Marcelo Garcia teaching it or Ryan Hall teaching his guard, Mm -hmm. um, and watch the little, we all have different things, especially at the black belt level, especially at that world-class elite level. Yeah. They all have their own little details that they teach. So I think the biggest thing is the stuff that you already know, those are the videos I would watch. Um, The different transitions from, you know, an arm bar to a triangle to an omoplata, you know, watch those videos and watch the different aspects and different details that each of those high level people, like you said, there's so much content out there. You could learn, you could learn a triangle from 50 world champions right now online. And I guarantee they're all going to teach something a little bit different. So find those details and maybe you add five of those deal, de- details to your game, your guard game. And when you get back, it's, you're just going to be so much better for that. So I always, I always say like at our level, we can watch stuff and learn new techniques because we understand movement. And I would say even, you know, high level purples and, and browns, the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but really white belts should be using the videos really. Like I said, the solo drill is great. You know, you can learn all that stuff. But uh, learn the techniques you already kind of have an understanding of or you think you have an understanding of because watching those videos is going to create true, true competency in those techniques. You know, we all teach differently. You know, you, you showed, uh, you showed the bow tie series at our Invicta seminar in Las Vegas and I teach Mm -hmm. the bow tie, but you had some cool little details that I don't teach, but now I teach those. Mm -hmm. So even, even us, you know, as black belt instructors, we pick up stuff from each other all the time. Yeah. No hand placement, you know, positional details body weight, you know, details, all that stuff adds. So I think, you know, white belts can do the same thing for their own games. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen? You know, I'm going to kind of come back to something because 
again, Jason and I were talking about this, but garage gyms, um, you know, Chris Howder has his little small gym, right? And it's kind of like, imagine if all these schools close, there's going to be garage gyms again. You know, yes. to be honest, I plan on doing it. So, yeah, you know, what's funny is I actually debated that. Say I had to close down my gyms. Is uh, I have a pretty big, pretty big yard. Uh, I debated, you know, taking out a taking out a loan and building a big garage in my backyard. Yeah. And matting it. I know. I think I think we will see an increase in that. I think especially if anyone has to close their gym, mm -hmm. I think we will see that increase in uh, garage gyms. I actually was kind of laughing. I just saw a Facebook or a Craigslist post today for free jujitsu lessons. <laughs> in a garage so you know i just i kind of giggled because i obviously i open it and uh i look at it i start laughing because it's like a, a two-stripe blue belt right uh, it's you know offering offering jujitsu lessons yeah it, it's like a donation based thing and i and i get it but you know at the same time i just i think we will see it though i would love to roll with chris Hopper's. yeah that guy's amazing so you know i think we'll have those gyms and i think we're going to have some of the kind of the um, changes, you know, uh, as far as, you know, the white belts and blue belts that want to teach their buddies, um, starting their own gyms, you know, mm -hmm. in the garage. I think that blue belt to put the free lessons, I think they're just looking for someone to roll with. I think that's all that is. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Cause, uh, you know, it got, it got sent out to our group and I have a couple of my, obviously a couple of the black belts. We're going to, we're going to play a joke on them and show up as they just started doing jujitsu. They didn't know anything. And I was like, guys, don't do that. Oh my God. Uh, you know, you know how, you know how black belts are. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. So where do you go from here? You know, I mean, we're going to be close for the next few months. Obviously, you're going to do some videos, you said, with uh, your brown belt and stuff like that. Um, and you're offering some of those the great incentives to your students and things. Uh, I hope June is, uh, you know, the date. Um, and I know that it keeps changing. I know the president is, you know, first he was like two weeks and then he's like, oh, by Easter. And so I think he should probably be quiet for a moment <laughs> and just yes. let it just work its way through. So um, I don't know. And I'm going to be talking to other people. I'm talking to uh, Keith Owen tomorrow. I'm talking to my Japanese jiu-jitsu instructor, uh, uh, Steve Hisko, I, uh, James Foster I'm going to be talking to. So there's all these guys. Hopefully we'll get more insight on how we can help each other out. Any kind of final thoughts that you can think about on how to move forward or frustrations that maybe academy owners or students are having and how they can kind of move through this? I think the big thing for academy owners, um, as far as I was going to give advice is, uh, stay in constant communication, you know, with your, with your students and the families and the parents of your kids, student, you know, child students, um, maybe a weekly email where you just kind of let them know what's going on, check in with them, remind them if they're having struggles to, you know, get a hold of you and you can, you can hold, you know, place memberships on hold. Um, I think, you know, one time right when it starts and then not talking to them or, or having any communication until you reopen in May or June, um, you know, I, I don't think that's appropriate. I think, you know, yeah. maybe every other week you send out an email, let everyone know how's everything's going and, yeah. you know, send me, send in videos of your kids doing training at home. If you, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of, you know, sisters or brothers and sisters that train, yeah. um, you know, do some jujitsu on your mom or dad, you know, send me a video, it, you know, you could run little competitions, you know, the best arm bar you know, on a, on your mom gets, you know, 10 bucks, you know, and you can send them $10, small things like that, I think go a long way. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the frustration is just not knowing, you know? Yeah. I think we deal with that enough. I think, especially the academy owners that are law enforcement. Yeah. I think we're in a unique position where we have jobs, which is, which is awesome. But uh, I think the added stress of not knowing what's going to happen to our academies that we didn't have to open, that we opened out of, you know, out of, out of love for jujitsu. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And all the stresses we deal with at work. I know uh, COVID just started hitting my department pretty hard. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah. So we had our we had our first we had our first officer um, test positive this week, and uh, it's obviously it's going to start hitting our department pretty hard. So now you know I'm looking at staffing and scheduling, and mm -hmm. you know meeting with our chief and our deputy chiefs, and 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 trying to develop you know plans to mitigate mitigate our department and then I, I come home and I worry about spreading it to my family. So I'm living right. in my travel trailer right now. <laughs> Me too, right? You know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough, you know, so those stresses, I think, you know, and then at least we do have jobs, which is nice, but I know like my coach, you know, jujitsu is his, that is his job. Yeah. It's his only job. Yeah. So, you know, talking to him, you know, I see his stresses and trying to get, you know, loans and, and deal with people canceling and, and, you know, every time someone cancels, that's, that's a hit. 
you know, it, yeah. it definitely affects your life. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, so I think, like I said, I think the biggest frustration for me is not knowing. Um, I wish there was a, a more clear time when we'd be reopening so we could give that to our families. But mm -hmm. for now, I just tell everybody to hang tight and um, there's going to be gyms that close because of this. Uh, there's going to be small businesses that close all over the country because of this, all over the world. Yeah. Um, I just, I would tell people that if you can, if you can make it, find a way to get through it because I think the ones that survive this are really going to reap the benefits of being able to stay open and, you know, you know, people have to put their, you know, their own savings money in or pull out 401k money to keep their academies open. Yeah. I would tell you, yeah. in my opinion, it's going to be worth it. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you, Jerry. Uh, you've done a lot for me personally, and uh, I think you're a fantastic coach. And I think that what you're doing for law enforcement is awesome. I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, you are the first in a hopefully long uh, line of instructors that will be chatting about this and how to get through the COVID stuff. And I know that as it goes on, we'll come up with more ideas. So uh, really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Uh, how, it's good to see how, your face. Yeah, it's still here. How can people get in touch with you uh, website-wise, uh, social media? How can they contact? Uh, social media, just you can look up Hallert BJJ on at Hallert BJJ on Instagram. Um, you can get me on Facebook. It's just under Jerry Hallert. Uh, Gerald Hallert's my fan page, so don't go there. Um, I don't look at that very much. So just Jerry Hallert on Facebook. Uh, website wise, you can go uh, BJJRenoTahoe.com. Um, anything you send there from contact will go right to my right to my personal email. So I try to respond obviously within a day or two. So. Like I said, in any any academy owners, students that have questions, anything like that, feel free to hit me up, and you know I'll help out wherever I can. Obviously, just like we always say, I don't know all the answers, but I know some. Yeah. And uh, but all together, hopefully, we can come up with a great plan for people. And something that we're planning to do, I don't know if it's going to happen in 2020, but maybe 21. But uh, Jason and I were talking about we're doing these obviously these super seminars, and uh, you were at the Nevada one, which was great. We did one in Houston, and down the road, what we want to do is we want to actually do a camp. And that will have more than four instructors. We, I'm going to bring you and everyone else who's taught and we'll just have like a huge weekend, kind of what Origin does. Uh, they do a big camp. So that's something to look forward to. And you're definitely going to be on the list uh, for all our listeners out there. If you haven't checked out Jerry's stuff, he is awesome. Uh, he switched on. He's a great advocate for jujitsu and policing and uh, really appreciate you. So thanks for joining us, man. Absolutely. Thank you, Ari. I appreciate what you and Jason are doing too with Invictus, man. You guys are awesome. My pleasure. Okay, take care. All right, brother. Stay safe.